Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today's question is, how should we talk to children about grief and loss? And I'm in conversation with Amanda Sederhelm, an experienced play therapist who enables children to make sense of their feelings and to find a comfortable way to express themselves and their worries through their natural language of play. So hello, Pookie. Uh, my name's Amanda Sederhelm. I am a child therapist and I help children and teach people how to connect with children through play uh, using story uh, because children connect with um, difficult experiences through story and play, which is their natural language. Um, I'm also the author of a book called Helping Children Cope with Loss and Change. There we are. Thank you. Uh, Which is a guide, a very practical guide for professionals um, and for parents, helping them navigate um, how to talk to children about uh, their grief and their losses, whether that's bereavement, uh, changing school, uh, divorce. It covers a whole spectrum of, of loss for children. And I guess you couldn't have possibly known when you wrote it quite how relevant it was going to be to so many people um, in this moment in time, because I guess obviously there's sadly a lot of bereavement at the moment, but also lots of kind of loss and separation. I'm working with lots of people who are saying that there's issues there where children have been been, been kind of parted. Why did you write it? What, what inspired it? Mm, great question. I wrote, before this book, I wrote a picture book called Isaac and the Red Jumper, which is a, a story about a childhood bereavement, a little boy who loses his best friend. Uh, and when he does, his red jumper turns gray. And it's through the process of, of coming to terms with that loss that his jumper turns back to red. Um, that was the inspiration really for uh, looking at how story can help children unpick and tell their own stories. And Routledge saw it and said, would I write a collection of stories? And that really started a conversation about, well, how do we talk to children really about Mm -hmm. grief and loss? What is the arc of that conversation? Um, So it was really a very dynamic commission because it was through talking to them that we, we, we both really discovered that what was needed was a framework to hang the stories on and to look at loss um, and grief in, in, the, in the broader context. So really, it, it evolved. It was an evolution. It was a conversation that began with a picture book um, and, uh, and grew, grew out of that, really. Grew from so what that. does that framework look like? Can you explain that a little bit? Mm. So for me, the, the context is loss whatever that is and however we define it produces change Mm -hmm. and it's that equation really that needs to be held in a therapeutic context in a an educational context and to recognize that whatever the loss is there it will produce a change for a child Mm -hmm. and it's it's not looking at them in isolation it's looking at them together and that through looking at the change we then look at what needs to be resolved and it's coming to terms with the resolution aspects of the change that produces the resilience. So there are four parts to the framework really. One is to identify the loss itself and to name it, you know, to really, to to name it for the child as well, Um, to identify the change that produces. And as you say, separation is a key part of all of this looking at what that separation means um, for the child. It produces huge anxiety, massive anxiety. I'm seeing a lot of that at the moment. Um, And that automatically, and it does for adults as well, it brings up um, issues that have been perhaps unresolved um, from the the past or even from the present, you know, whatever the relationship, uh, whatever relationship is is being um, looked at. And then only then can we look at, resilience so for me it it's it it is a and it's fluid as well it's not a rigid step system um but it it, it's helpful to have that framework to then place story within so story 
usually comes within the change element, the change part of the framework. When you're looking at change, you're looking at story because that's narrative, that's picture, that's imagination, that's creativity. Um, that's where you open it up, how you open it up, how you open up that conversation. And what kind of change do, does it refer to when you're talking about change? I mean, change is a, a, a kind of big word, encompasses many things. What, what, what kind of thing are we looking at there? Um, if we're looking at divorce, let's say, mm -hmm. it can often mean huge change in terms of lifestyle. It mm -hmm. can mean a child moving or losing a home, mm -hmm. uh, gaining another, but actually the change aspect is the transition. Mm -hmm. It's learning to navigate that transition from something that may be, not necessarily, but may be secure, a secure mm -hmm. base home may not be, um, but whatever it is, it's familiar. However uncomfortable or comfortable that is, it's familiar. Mm -hmm. So the change is the loss of ritual, loss of routine, loss of familiarity. Um, mm -hmm. And actually those things are quite common in all aspects of change. If a, if a, for instance, if a teacher, you know, the children returning to school, they may find not all their teachers are there. Mm -hmm. We don't know how many of those uh, have died, um, you know, have, have had to move into a different location, can't go back to school. So the change there will be, again, um, around familiarity. Um, and that will automatically trigger, well, routine. I always go and do certain things with my teacher and I can't do that anymore. So it's about then the change would be, I've got to now build a new relationship with a new person, which can bring up other losses around, well, if I am in a family environment where, you know, mum and dad uh, or whatever the structure is of that family, if they've separated, that's going to trigger separation anxiety. So then the change, that's like a chain reaction. Yeah. Um, but it's always around ritual, re-establishing ritual, re-establishing routine, transition. Um, that, that's, that's always in the mix there with change. So how do we go about helping children to kind of work through that process of kind of managing that change and, and yeah, re-establishing routine and, and, and ritual? You, you talked already a bit about, you know, obviously story and play, and that's your very much your error isn't it I mean yeah how, tell me how what, what, what do you do how do you make it work I think the first thing we need to do is to uh, recognize and accept um, and this isn't always easy to do that children aren't adults so they don't and they don't therefore process things in the same way so um, the first thing I always say is don't confront a child uh, who's grieving um, and ask them directly how they're feeling. That question itself can be quite confrontational, quite invasive, um, and it can make a child shut down and withdraw, and that can make them isolated, and then you're into another sort of spiral. So, so don't uh, ask them, how are you? No, that can be a very confronting question. And actually, um, I've seen young children, sort of in five, six-year-olds, when they are confronted with the question, so how do you feel about, you know, the fact that, you know, daddy's just died or mummy's just died? And you can see them physically recoiling from the person yeah. uh, as if to say, I don't know what you mean. Mm -hmm. and, and literally their brains cannot, you know, compute, cannot understand, cannot process that question. It's too big. Um, it's too... Big. It's too um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, rational, really. It's not in their language. So the second thing is to communicate in a language that children understand, which is which is play, and to introduce early on um, a research, something creative, and use that as a prompt. That's your conversational prompt. Okay. So rather than it being a question that you, you and I might say to each other, well, you know, how, how do you feel about that? Did you know, well, Amanda, what, what's, what might be going on for you there? We could then natter about that and, and unpick it together. Yeah. Um, children unpick things in what we call the safe distance of a, of a metaphor of a story. That's how they will um, open up their 
their their world and their stories and their and their feelings so we we then that's when we provide them with a a resource like story to it's almost like opening a door you know mm -hmm. when you when you introduce that you are literally metaphorically opening a door for a child you're saying come in sit down get comfortable on the bean bag together and we will we'll go on this this journey together you you're alongside them and i think yeah. when i read uh when i read stories to children i i tend to i like to get alongside them physically uh -huh. so that they can feel that presence you know obviously it's the space will depend on on that particular child but um so you get alongside yeah. them and you read the story together or you 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 play together what i mean what does that process kind of look like? Would you say we're going to sit and read a story about X now? Or I mean, how would you literally manage that situation? Um, I think it's helpful to think about it. Um, I Three things I do when I'm thinking about this is one is it's the three R's really. You create a ritual, yeah. uh, you read and you reflect. So for the child, it's about an invitation. Um, mm -hmm you know, why don't we sit down the beanbags together and read a story? And of course, you will have thought it through beforehand what that story is going to be, yeah. unless it's a story time where you're going to create a story. And that's, that's a different thing that we, we can talk about separately. But if it's a, a book that you're reading, yeah. um, I like to think it through beforehand what that child might want to, to read about. If the issue is anger, let's just pick that because it's a very, very common reaction mm. i will select a book that um is about that about a character who is very very angry once the child sits down i will then read the story you know literally i'm holding the book i'm turning the pages go very slowly mm -hmm. um allowing space and time for the child to actually imagine because there's a lot of imagination going on in the storytelling that they are that character. If they, the minute they start to um, point and say, oh, you know, um, yeah, Marvin the Sheep is getting very cross about that, you know, oh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I get that. You're in. That's yeah. when the child has decided that they are going to engage. Yeah. And really, then it's a process of just carrying that through to the end and then using that story to um ask ask questions you know so have you have you do you feel that you know that might be something you can relate to and just test the water but the rule is usually if a child is talking about the character in the book yeah. rather than personalizing and going i feel like that yeah stay stay with the metaphor okay. stay with that so be led by yeah the, the frame of reference that they're they're kind of using mm. and mm. would you stick with those characters so if you've had marvin the sheep would you then refer to that sheep in other wider conversations or just whilst you're literally reading that book um just while you're reading the book um you could you could return to marvin um in a later um session or a conversation mm. in an interaction you know as a reflection and say remember remember marvin and yeah. and see what that uh prompts um but usually it, it the child will remember and will go oh, yeah I, I do remember that yeah. and then at some point it'll be i remember yeah. the i then comes okay. back in mm. and that's important it is because that's the point at which i realize that the child has bridged that gap between um, usually shock and mm. some kind of recognition that the experience they've had, yeah. how it's affecting them. So is it's that not part, just, sorry, go on. No, no, carry on. I was just going to say, is that part of uh, the kind of grief process? I mean, do you see a, a typical movement through, through a process or what, what does that look like? Um, I think in the very early stages of a bereavement where someone's actually died, um, young children tend to almost do what we call puddle jumping. They, they can jump in and out of their grief very quickly. Okay. And their, the arc of their grieving process does not mirror the, the familiar ones that, you know, like the five stages of grief, yeah. the Kubler-Ross model. Um, 
children's grief is very different in that they they can be very sad mm -hmm. um one moment and then the next moment they can be very um joyful mm -hmm. and that can make i've seen adults get very distressed about that yeah. you know why why is why is sammy suddenly skipping around the garden it's the funeral today why, why are they doing that well they're doing it because they can't actually process the feelings yeah. um, that they're actually feeling. So what I see is a delayed reaction. Okay. And I think it can be very tempting sometimes to think, oh, their children are fine. They're fine. They're not having any bad reaction. They're okay. Yeah. Usually it just means it's become, it's gone underground right. and it will be an external pressure or mm -hmm. event at school that will suddenly trigger them and then they'll be having a meltdown mm -hmm. and then the question is why are they having a meltdown what's what, what what's happened actually it's the loss that's just become very real for them yeah so it's been kind of held and then suddenly something sort of mm. triggered that response if mm. a child is doing that kind of puddle jumping that you describe should they be encouraged to actually sit with the more difficult feelings or should we embrace if they want to laugh and smile and jump around um we we should be led by them so i think the i was it's interesting i was talking to a, a father yesterday whose wife um had died leaving four young children wow. and yeah i know wow it was yeah very hard and he he said you know the thing is the difficult thing is grief children when they need me need to the floor and and be with I or it can happen when I'm putting them to bed it doesn't happen on a schedule when I think I'm available and I'm going to now spend some time with my children talking about you know losing their mum mm. and I hear that a lot it, it, and it's very difficult to do in a busy a busy house or in a busy school but it's it's really important that we give children the message that yes we can respond to them okay. when they need us so if they are joyful accept that they are having a joyful moment because it may not last for very long and then yeah. they will be in the depths of their sadness and despair and we need to sit with them with that as well yeah i'm wondering for like that father that you mentioned how it does mm. it feel for the adult around the child or children if they're doing that jumping in and out of that grief because there's the adult's grief to consider as well isn't there um, absolutely and how yeah what what would you advise there i mean if you're a, an adult who is grieving and your child is grieving very differently than you how can you be the adult that they need it, it's a great question um and there's no, there's no slick answer to that. Mm -hmm. I think it's, <laughs> it is a literally a moment by moment um, experience and, a, and, and a, um, a compassionate response as well to the fact that we're not always going to get it right. There may be times when the adult can't always be the adult, but the key I think for the children is to know that you're in it together. Okay. That whatever the response is going to be, it is never their fault. It's not, it's not something they've done wrong. And I think with, with grief, there's a lot of guilt that can, that can creep in um, and it can get quite corrosive if it's not just called out. You know, there, there's no, there's, and, and shame that can come very quickly with, from that too. Um, I think that's the point at which you sink to your knees. Yeah. You just literally sink to your knees and you say, I'm going to put everything aside. I, I know I should be doing something else, but actually we are just going to sit here together for 10 minutes. Um, and that 10 minutes will probably save hours of time because the child will feel held and heard. Mm -hmm. And actually it might help the adult too, to realize that it's about the connection yeah. to the, the feeling. Um, and I think often when I talk to parents about their own grief response, it, it usually has a resonance, a deep resonance for them with previous losses. Uh -huh. And so, you know, you touch one, you, 
you start to touch the others. So very quickly, it's like a piece of elastic that, that starts to get, you know, get, get tight and then it, suddenly it snaps. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the point at which to think, well, actually, as an adult, do I need, what support do I need to put in place for myself? Is it, is it something creative? Is it something, um, you know, where I need to talk it out? Um, do I, I mean, I've heard you talk a lot about, you know, having support around you, having the right level of support. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something I, I recognize, you know, it's really important to have uh, grown up support as well, not, you know, so for the children too. And do you think that as an adult who is, involved with a child's grief so maybe you're their parent or carer and so you're deeply involved with it or perhaps you just know them and the person who's died and you've known them a long time you might be their teacher or support staff or, or, or someone who's involved and you might be feeling this grief too do you need to be kind of you know strong and brave and supportive or is it okay to really sink into that grief and really feel it with the child I think it's, that's a really great question. I think there are two parts to that. Um, yes, it's important to sink in, but not too far to the okay. point where um, the adult part of you almost takes over and overshadows, if you like, the child because they won't be able to understand that necessarily. So you have to hold yourself um, and in holding yourself, allow the real, the raw part of you to, to just come through enough so yeah. that there's a, there's a connection there, but yeah. not to the point where you're using that time to just go, oh, you know, I'm offloading. Um, uh, because really, I finding this very, very difficult. But also it's, um, I refer to it in my book, there's um, a, a quote it's, it's learning to bear the unbearable. Um, and we, we learn to bear the unbearable by creating small enough rituals for ourselves so that when those moments occur, yeah. we don't get so overwhelmed by them. Um, but, and it, it can be really challenging to sink in, but it can also sometimes be very tempting to do that. It's just learning where you can sink in, but not to the point where you can't get up again, you know? Yeah. Um, so is yeah. it okay to cry with a child? I think it's, I, yes, personally think it, it is important to do that, to do that for the child to see um, that it's okay to do that. You know, that's, it's sort of permission led. Mm. Um, and they see, they see mummy and daddy uh, expressing their feelings and, kind of normalizing that response rather than it being you know we've got to keep it all in the bottle and yeah. smile our way through it and be stoic I think that's the, the sort of um that's that's more difficult and it's harder because yeah. the message can then be that you know it's not okay it's not okay I think it's very Mm. Yeah, I was going to say, I think sometimes children are better at it than, than we are. I think maybe the sort of natural response that children have to bereavement is, is perhaps in some ways healthier than the way that we learn through our lifetimes and how we might feel we should do this as a grown-up. I, I don't know, maybe mm. that's not mm. right, but um, yeah, I remember when my um, children were littler, so they're 10 now, but when... I, I think how long ago it would have been but we lost a very close family friend who they'd known since they were tiny and um when he died um it was at a time when i was still very much uh learning to uh feel um so i i've you know long history of, mm. of, of finding feeling difficult um but my children were amazing in their response and i tried always to create an environment where they could feel even if i found it hard but i remember very vividly um very soon after uh, richard died lyra sitting on my knee um, and just saying to me mommy i think maybe we need to have a good cry about this and it was a very kind of you know she's very <laughs> articulate about it yeah and i remember just thinking with her you know and just saying i think maybe you're right actually and we did and it was it felt so much better, I think, for both of us that we did that. But I just remember this very earnest mm. little child thing. I think we need to have a good cry. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I remember. I think that's that's beautiful that you were able 
mm. to take take your lead from from her um I, I remember when my um one of my goddaughters uh, came to stay just after i'd uh, recovered from from cancer and this is this is many many years ago and i was washing her hair and i was you know combing it out and um she said uh you know i i know that you've been you've been really 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 poorly yeah. and she just lost someone someone else in her family to cancer and i just knew she was basically using code to say are you going to die you know oh, wow. um and i just said i'm i'm not going anywhere you know i'm here for you it's okay um and the hug you know the hug got got tighter and got oh, tighter and tighter yeah. so sometimes it's just saying something small um just catching it catching the um the moment um and that's all that's needed you know then they can skip off again and um and, and carry on um yeah lots of little moments mm. Do you think that there is a, a kind of a, a, a right way and a wrong way to do this? Are there things that we should be kind of catching ourselves and definitely kind of not doing? Um, or should we be kind of more intuitive? And um, I feel strongly that one thing we should be doing is recognizing that, that grief is real and it exists for okay. children. And I think I'm concerned about this as the children return to school in September, yeah. that there will be a pressure on them to learn um, academically, but there, there needs to be, I believe, a, a period of time where there's ref lots of space and lots of reflection so that um, they've got the headspace to be able to do that. I've, I think, Grief can sometimes be very invisible and it's about be making it more visible. Um, and I don't see that enough in schools. And we know the stats, you know, the stats are that one child in every classroom is bereaved. And that was before COVID, yeah. you know, now we've got higher numbers um, of that, you know, what is it? 46,000 people have died. So that's, you know, 46,000 families who've had some kind of, um, bereavement um, yeah I'd like to see I'd like to see all schools having um, not just a bereavement policy because I think bereavement policies can be about management they can be about letting people know about um, deaths and, and and but not necessarily putting in place the the support that that children and staff need um, mm. in order to cope with that. I mean, I had a case recently where I was contacted by a school. A um, little boy had had died. He drowned, and wow. uh, he was eight, eight years old. And the um, the school absolutely devastated, and it, it affected everybody in that school. It wasn't just the family; it was mm. everyone needed to have some way of uh, being able to to cope with and express that grief and um, the shocking thing was that that particular school didn't have a bereavement policy and they didn't have any support in place at all they were literally doing it from the, the ground up wow. so uh, yes i would like to see um, therapeutic storytelling introduced in all schools so that there is a story time approach to bereavement um, because I think that's as important as, as just making sure that you've ticked the boxes and let everybody know about who knows what and, and where everybody's, uh, is everybody on the same page? Are people going to the funeral or not? That's all very important. Yeah. But um, as important is the, the sort of the response, the emotional response to that, putting that support in place. And you use um, play as well as storytelling to explore. Mm. How does mm. that play out, if you like? <laughs> um, well, playing playing out is is really telling stories just through different mediums. So, in addition to story, I use uh, painting and uh, drawing, um, music and sand. You know, the, the play therapy kit has all these different mediums in them. Yeah. The little miniature objects and figures that are used to tell to tell stories um and really when a child comes into the room they are 
because it's a child-centered approach, mm. they will select, they will self-select the medium that they want to work with. Yeah. Um, my job really is to facilitate that, is to, is yeah. to be able to um, be quiet enough um, so that they can use the medium to tell me the story that they are acting out perhaps yeah. in their behavior somewhere else. Um, so yes, I would say drawing and painting are two of the most useful mediums. Um, but, but they are really just mediums. It's about the relationship really mm -hmm. and the trust and the rapport that, that, uh, I build with them in the room. And that's, that's something again, that I think I'd like to see that, uh, being duplicated as well, because it's a model that, um, I mean, not everybody can have play therapy not every school can have a play therapist mm -hmm. but what is possible is to use the the reflective um tools that can be that are used in play therapy those can be used in the schools as well and particularly during this time i was going to say i mean yeah every every school is going to have children about whom they're concerned whether there's been a bereavement or um, another form mm -hmm. of loss or separation um and so i think many people will be looking to step up but there's a fear there isn't there because you know someone like yourself who's got many many years of training and expertise in this mm -hmm. versus say a, a, a teaching assistant who has got a really strong relationship with a child but hasn't been trained in this and mm -hmm. is it okay for them to do this uh no <laughs> would be my short answer to that um for two reasons one is i think if you've not had the the therapeutic training you it's very difficult to know what you're holding yeah. and what you're potentially unpacking yeah. uh, innocently and from the very best of intentions but if you are unpacking a child's uh, emotional experience without that yeah. it can be quite dangerous um, because you'll, you you may be leaving the child unheld um, and you yourself may also then, you know, you've got to then deal with that experience. So um, I think it would be safer um, if teaching assistants could have supervision mm -hmm. so that they had a place to go and take and process themselves. Um, but I see this a lot. And without that supervision in place, it's not a safe environment to, to be doing that. No. So that's um, the key issue, the supervision. I think supervision is key, yes. I think if schools are going to introduce um, this, this kind of tool, then I think they, they do need to provide regular supervision for those, for those uh, um, support staff, definitely. And what do you think is the role of the support staff or the, the class teachers or anyone really who might have that, you know, good positive relationship with the child and really wants to help where maybe they are in an mm. environment where there isn't access to um, someone like yourself? What should they be doing? What's the best thing they can do? Um, I think there are two things. I think one is they can learn how mm. to use reflection as a tool okay. uh, in a way that's safe. Um, that's that's manageable that's that can be done in the playground it can be done in the classroom um, that doesn't unpack things too much okay. um, the second thing is I think to put in place a uh, a resource like storytelling that is actually a very containing experience it allows that th th it gives the teacher a framework really mm -hmm. to say actually you know at this time we are going to spend 15 to 20 minutes um, together. The yeah. child then has the expectation that they know they can hold that until yeah. that point. Um, and it allows the, the, the teacher or the learning the teaching assistant to plan, you know, to, to build it around their own, their own routine. Yeah. Um, yeah. To sort of to plan. And that can be a, you know, I've seen it work really well with groups, not just okay. with classes, not just with individuals. I think there's something I did a, a group um, piece of group work for a, for a primary school um, around transition. And, you know, the, uh, the exercise was to build a rocket. Yeah. You know, we're going to build a rocket ship together. Yeah. Um, and we did it over a period of weeks. And what was interesting was how the children connected with each other during that, 
experience. It wasn't just about building the rocket. It was it was okay. about how they learnt to be with each other as well. So it, the story, whatever you're doing, can be can be done in a group. So the story doesn't necessarily have to be kind of specifically about grief and loss. It can be it's about others building other skills as well. Or I mean, yeah. what was the thought behind mm. the rocket? Um, it was for children who were struggling to have social peer relationships uh -huh, okay, okay. and they were there were different challenges for each one but but the common ground was that they found it difficult to build for, to have friendships yeah. um, so when they started that group uh, I think it was a six-week group there was a lot of silence mm -hmm. you know nobody wanted to take part no one wanted to go first but as soon as I introduced the idea that they were going to build this rocket ship together and there was a bunch of crafting resources in the middle and they could, you know, use these um, each week, there was a task for them to complete so mm. that we'd get a little bit further towards the end of the building the rocket ship. Um, it was fascinating because they slowly came out of their little shells. Mm -hmm. You know, they started to dare, I think, dare themselves to pick up, and sometimes it would be, you know, well, today I'm going to choose coloured paper, um, whereas, I, you know, I've not done that before. Mm. Um, and can you pass me the glue? Can we share the glue? Can we stick things together? Can we make it? Can we build something together? And, and that was, yeah, it was fascinating, really. And is that about the group kind of coming together because they're doing, you know, they've got a shared goal? Or is that about creating a safe environment? Or is it a mixture of those things or something else? Uh, I think it's a mixture of all of those things. I think what was really critical was knowing that each week at a certain time they were going to be decamping to the okay. <laughs> uh, the PE cupboard, you know, yeah. um, and that they would be spending that half an hour, 40 minutes together. That might be an important thing for people to be aware of then as well, if that having, yeah, that discrete time and, and, and perhaps mm. some sort of structured idea about what might happen in that, but knowing that at this time, that's when we will create or play or explore. On, on. Mm. Mm. I think, I think so. And uh, it was secure. Yeah. It was, a, it was a safe boundary space. Uh, no one was going to come in at that time and say, you've got to come to a lesson. It was, yeah. it was their time. Uh, it, I know it sounds like a luxury, probably, but it was it was essential. It was essential time um, time out for them, uh, and they were working very hard in that room. You know, anyone yeah. perhaps looking from the outside may have thought, "Oh, they're just building a parachute, or they're yeah. building a rocket." But actually, yeah. they were they were learning to build their own parachutes and rockets in there, um, and through the the shared experience of confronting their own obstacles so it was very difficult I remember for one little girl particularly to ask for help okay. um you know she she her uh family were very fragmented and her mom she was a single mom and it was just the two of them together she'd mm -hmm. become very um very attached to her mum uh, and it was hard for her to trust anyone else in the room um, but slowly we did a little check-in drawing which is something I do a lot with with groups and with with children and with adults is draw a, a picture of how you're feeling each day on a paper plate and it doesn't have to be uh, it's not about creating art it's about a representation of how you feel yeah. and uh, this little girl her name wasn't Daisy. I'm going to call her Daisy. Her name wasn't Daisy, but Daisy made these drawings and to the point where on the final session, she came into the room and very quietly went over and took her paper plate off the pile and grabbed the pencils and started to do, you know, I didn't have to say now we're going to do the check-in. She was ready. She built that inner confidence to know that that was her plate. That was her plate. She put her feelings on there. Oh, wow. um, so yeah, and how do you end concern. then? Because you've built that lovely relationship and, and that trust and that safety and <laughs> then it ends. I mean, how does that work? Oh, it's heartbreaking uh, for me to, to often say goodbye. And I think the ending is almost as important as the beginning mm -hmm. because the ending 
can be often a reflection of some broken endings, you know, that have happened before. Mm. Um, so I try to build in time to prepare for that ending, to say early on, okay, in two weeks time, we are going to be ending this and let's think about what we need to prepare for that ending. Yeah. And just by asking the question and putting it in the room, I don't always get a response, but what has happened is that the idea has been seeded and yeah. it's out there. Um, and then we can play with that. Yeah. So when you, I think you asked a question about, is there a right and a wrong way of doing anything? I would say to that, um, no, there isn't. But whatever comes up that feels uncomfortable, unbearable, really grainy and scratchy, use mm. that, put that into the, the play, the creativity, make it part of the conversation. What if it's something <clears throat> really hard? I mean, is that anything that we should be kind of hiding or shielding our kids from? I think probably hiding or shielding say what you mean a, bit, a little bit more about hiding or shielding ask the therapist in you coming out <laughs> <laughs> so say for example i am um working with a child and uh daddy has died and i know that daddy has died because mummy murdered daddy is that something that the child needs to know mm, mm. well at some point, yes, the child is going to need to know that. Um, it, it's a tricky one, I think, in terms of shielding and hiding. I, I think the more we hide, the more secrets we create, the lack of trust starts to creep in very quickly. Yeah. Um, and that bothers me because I, can, I spend a lot of time with secrets. Mm. Hot, you know, being witness, if you like, to the fallout from those secrets. So I would, my tendency is to always say, be as truthful as you can, mm. but always test that what you're about to say or share isn't going to cause harm to your child. See, there's a level of honesty that I think always has to be present. But if you think that honesty is is going to cause um it harm then then don't yeah but don't hide i think the hiding it is something that i think always comes back to bite really i guess because a child who yeah in that like that example i shared or if uh someone has died by suicide for example that mm. that is a truth that's not going to go mm. away i guess isn't it and if they don't exactly. have the chance to explore it safely they will i i guess still learn this at some point somehow maybe when they're not in such a safe situation yeah that's a good example because i i know um of a family who a, a very young family actually as in the parents were in their 20s and the father um committed suicide uh he hanged himself and uh their daughter was two at the time wow. now in that situation she was clearly too young to share that information with it, was, it wasn't appropriate for her to know that. No. But what is, I think, important is to not hide, um, hide those facts from her forever. You know, at some point that needs to be a conversation. So I think it's about finding the appropriate time to, to have the open and honest conversation. Mm. And I think to make that as child-friendly as possible. So again, just dipping into a, you know, a toolkit or a, um, something that's child friendly so that you can start to just start to have the conversation. You don't have to have the whole conversation. Mm. It's just a little bit at a time. Um, and see where it, see where it goes. And will that naturally come up at some point? So in that example where the mm. child is very young, I mean, will they just start asking questions one mm. day or do we mm. need to prompt it? I think they will start asking questions and it's, you know, where's daddy? Mm -hmm. As soon as that um, becomes very real for them yeah. in that they cannot. And of course they will be feeling that loss and that absence mm -hmm. before that. So that's another piece to bear in mind of how, mm -hmm. how we talk about that loss 
because mm. the child will be picking it up. But as soon as, yes, there is a, well, why haven't I got a daddy? You know, where's my daddy? Yeah. That's the time to start having the conversation. And does this look different for children with um, special or additional needs? Um, yes and no. Um, I was just, I, I was been, I've been thinking a lot about that, that particular question actually. And I think I've had children with special needs in my, in my practice who've, um, I'm just thinking of one particular little boy actually, whose who's dad um, was killed very suddenly. Mm -hmm. uh, they went on holiday and um, he had a car accident and the next day he, 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 he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. um, and actually for this particular child, uh, what was very helpful uh, was having safety of not talking about it directly for quite a long time. Okay. Um, that I noticed that that was that that was a difference i think what i'm trying to say there was there was a difference there he didn't want to talk about it directly for quite a long time um needed that safety of cover of of play of the of the the tools um and it was only actually towards the end of his therapy that he he did want to talk about it and did mention his dad yeah. so yes i think i think it is it is it is different slightly different and was that just about the that process just maybe took a little bit longer or the what, what do you think was going on for that child um i think every it, all children are different there isn't sort of a you know a one one size fits all but i think in his particular case um his mother uh was chinese and his father um was irish and there was a there was a very challenging cultural uh, conflict going on with both with both sort of families, mm -hmm. and I think that made it doubly difficult for him to locate himself after his dad died. Mm -hmm. um, he somehow found it almost there was a double loss there. He, yeah. He'd not just lost his dad; he'd lost access to his his other family, part of his family. Um, but yeah, he, and yet he was also a child, I remember, who wrote, fascinatingly, a lot of stories mm. using my, uh, I use a little template, um, divide the page up into six blocks, and he filled those blocks out every week, there was a new story. So a lot of useful data there in terms of that was what he, he needed to, to, to process. Yeah. You, you it must be hard doing what you do you're you're working with people in these hardest <coughs> moments is does it i mean what why do you do it what what inspired you to to do this <laughs> um i taught a painting class at uh, primary school mm -hmm. um it was a class called what color is your rainbow and i went into this group of children and um they all painted rainbows and what struck me afterwards was how they're all completely, completely different. There wasn't a single rainbow that looked like it. Nothing, actually, there were no obvious rainbows. That was the first thing that I noticed. And the second thing was that we had a gallery, we had like a little ex exhibition of these paintings on the floor. And I imagined that each child would just sort of say, well, that's my, that's my rainbow. But actually what came out was a flood of, of stories about their own personal lives. And there was one child whose rainbow was a wardrobe. And I said, well, tell me, tell me about your wardrobe. And he then described uh, in some detail, you know, how he'd been shut in a cupboard um, at home and couldn't get out. Nice. Um, so I, I came away thinking, goodness, you know, this is a very powerful medium for self-expression. Mm. And when I reported back to the, um, the head teacher, she said, we have not, we've not had anything like this in the school. And it was really the recognition that children, if you give them the right mediums, if you give them access, mm. they do communicate how they feel. And it was that, and I thought, I, I want to do this professionally. I want to learn how to do this. Um, 
you know, to help as many children as I can use their voice. So I think it was for me the, the element of the voices were there, the stories were there. They just didn't have a way out. I see. Um, yeah. They didn't have, a, didn't have a, an outlet. And once I saw that, I saw the potential and thought, right, it's uh, I'm going to retrain. So I did. Wow. So it's all about finding a way for a child to find their voice. Yes. Yes. I'd, I'd grown up, I'd spent 12 years of my life living, um, in Africa and I'd witnessed a lot of, obviously a lot of racism and oppression and, uh, what struck me, uh, and what I had to learn to do myself was to find my voice. And I saw how damaging it was to not have a voice. Yeah. and to feel disempowered from having a voice. And I think that early experience really stayed with me. Mm. And yeah, it made, made a huge impact. I thought, I don't, yeah, don't want to carry that around. So I think that was also an early influence for me. About finding the power you. of voice. Yeah. Is that yeah. how you, so you, do you use yourself kind of, art or other kind of creative means for expressing how you feel or is that some, something that you do in your own life as well as in your kind of professional life? Uh, yes, I paint. So painting is my thing. Uh, I find writing is great for um, expressing certain things, yeah. um, but actually the engine for me the, is the juice comes from the creative output. So uh, painting has always been something I've, I've, I've done. Um, not, I would say, to create any particular great work of art, but it's more about the expressive um, nature of it. I get to sort of bypass a lot of my, you know, intellectual brain. Uh, and, and then that's become, I become playful, I suppose. That's, that's how I play in the sandpit is, is in the paint box. Yeah. Uh, and get messy get very very messy really um, oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> uh i you know pour paint into paint jars and uh i i do that with the children as well you know pour it on the ground and have a have a uh big covering on the floor and, and do that because it's it's tactile it's it's mm. how we connect i think with the soulful aspects you know the the really the wounds that we have, that we all have, uh, that we carry around. And I think touching those all the time is what, yeah, keeps it, keeps it real. So it's about the, the process though, the painting, as in the process of painting or making or creating rather than what you create. Yes. It's the check. It's what I call the check-in. Yeah. So it's the checking in with myself. Um, I don't mean the, the ego part of me, but the, the sort of more soulful, uh, part of my, myself where I may be carrying those grainy, um, unbearable bits and th those need to, to be expressed. Um, and I think I've seen, I've seen families do, do that as well, do that kind of work um and it's a very connecting experience yeah it can be hard for adults though can't it who haven't maybe mm. been used to expressing themselves creatively and often when i suggest to people the use of any form of creative activity really then they say well they don't know how or they're not very good at it mm. or you know you get a lot of barriers in the way don't you i mean what would oh you yeah do that? um i just i just say give it a tr give it a try keep it mm. a simple keep it a simple as possible mm -hmm. i think very often i don't know whether you found this but when people are confronted by a blank page or yeah. you just say well here's a box of crayons they yeah. go oh, i'm not going to do that you know because i don't want you to see how terrible i am at drawing yeah. um so I, I might go first i might say well you know why don't we have a go together um and that can that can often be i mean do you is it something you you say you use that in your work as well I often 
suggest I, creative tools. Yeah, I do. I encourage any form of creativity just because I think that it can be so powerful. And like you said, really, I think it's, mm. it's a shortcut. So for me, actually, I, I use poetry a lot. So I encourage people to use poetry mm. and that's because it's something I found personally really powerful. Um, but I'm, I wouldn't, you know, I've written hundreds of poems and written a book about using poetry, but I wouldn't say I'm a good poet. I just mm. find it a great medium, you know, and mm. I think in, in a way, actually encouraging people to write really bad poetry mm. is a process, like for you really. Yeah. Yeah. And also sometimes I think about other people's interpretation of what you've done, whether that's something you've you've drawn or, or written or otherwise created. It's interesting to see what other people see in it sometimes, I think, and that can be an interesting part of the process too. But that that is you're right that's fascinating and actually when someone's drawn something to hold it up and say actually what you see or what they see and get that noticing going on of wow i hadn't hadn't noticed there was something like that in there yeah it can be very powerful yeah mm. i love I, that idea of writing bad poetry <laughs> i might have to use that <laughs> yeah write bad poetry. i'll send you i'll send you a copy of my, of my poetry book and it's got loads of prompts so should you wish to write your own bad poetry uh then uh, oh, yeah many prompts there for it yeah um, yeah i had some questions in via twitter from various people who who wanted to pick your brains so i don't get to ask all the questions are you happy for me to, to do a bit of a quick fire with you on, on yeah um, yeah sure so first of all, um, any advice for children aged seven to 11 who become fixated on death to the point that it's the main topic of conversation and they're convinced everyone or everything is going to die soon? Yes, that, that's, that's about fear of losing uh, the person closest to you, separation, anxiety. And I would say the key there is or how to move the conversation away from from death is is to, through comfort is through reassurance is through a ritual create a ritual that you can do uh, every day um, with that child uh, because it, it's really they're just expressing a, a fear of losing of losing you what um, kind of ritual you've mentioned rituals a few times what does a ritual mm, mean? a ritual can be anything from um, reading a story together to going for a walk mm -hmm. um, I know some children who that and they don't have to do it with both parents if both parents are there it can be or brother or sister go for a walk together mm -hmm. um, play a game play a puzzle um, not watching tv not on the ipad get mm -hmm. away from the technology um, it can be making pancakes together uh, I've got a great recipe for banana banana pancakes that I share a lot and that is something that's fun that has an outcome that's contained in a time limit mm -hmm. and they can be enjoyed together at the end of it they, they can eat it together um, so there's got to be a fun element to it yeah. as well as something that's quite bounded with time yeah okay and it's something that you would do many times routine or a, a ritual rather or you do it once or oh i think i think as yeah build it build it as a as a ritual so friday afternoon we're yeah. going to oh. make pancakes together and actually you could then extend that and say i'd like you to come up with a with a recipe for pancakes so is there anything you'd particularly like to make yeah and i'm just wondering here um about just applying from my own uh when my, my therapist uh, said to me uh one time long time ago i was I, I struggled with christmas historically a lot and i remember him saying you've got your own family now and you need to create your own rituals around christmas so rather getting mm -hmm. than getting hung up on all the things that you worry about the past it's time to create new ones um to almost like supplant the the tricky stuff I guess and is that true when we've lost someone if there might be certain times when we would have been doing something with the person who's died for example should we kind of try and find something else that we would do to almost replace that is that the right thing to do or I think um yes in a way but I think what needs to happen before there needs to be a little bridge uh -huh. from the old ritual to the new one okay. and that's usually when people use things like memory boxes yeah. um, and create albums of pictures they go through lots of pictures and 
it's almost like they need to put that part of the story of that person mm. um, away and have something real that they can show for it before they can go and build a new ritual over there. Yeah. Um, so if the, maybe the ritual was always about taking a walk together, uh, maybe you can take that walk together and plant a little tree somewhere so that you've got that space that you can always go back to, maybe have a picnic, something like that. Um, you don't, I wouldn't suggest going straight to the new ritual because that might be a little bit jarring. So you almost close that chapter first before you then open another one. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Um, oh, this is a tough one. My daughter's best friend's mum died by suicide in December. If I'm slightly sad or upset, my daughter is convinced I'm going to do the same. I've talked to her about the difference between sadness and mental illness and reassured her. But do you have any advice? Oh, that is really tough. Yeah. Um, I think it's very similar to all the different circumstances, but a similar response to the, the first question. It's about providing just absolutely tons of reassurance um, until the, the child starts to feel safer. Mm. And we do that through um, partly through ritual, but partly through reflection as well, just reflecting back I hear you I hear you're sad I hear that you're that you're angry that you're anxious that you're feeling lonely um and you know ultimately we can't fix this we, we can't give the um the unqualified assurance sometimes mm -hmm. which is what children want all we can do is say I'm here for you I hear you I understand mm -hmm. and sometimes that that is enough to hold the unbearable yeah. part of uh in this particular case a, a, a suicide which has its own particular um i think the grief that goes with suicide is quite unique actually um yeah because it's so hard mm yeah absolutely and i think that's that's hard children do generalize don't they in that way and the idea here that because my best friend's mum died by suicide that if my mum feels sad maybe she'll do that or you see it other times don't you where well um mm. perhaps a child suffers a, a couple of losses in quick succession and then therefore they worry that everybody will mm. will leave them or die and yeah that can be very hard can't it to manage it can i would recommend giving uh, that child a buying them a uh, a drawing book that's filled with empty pages mm. and sitting with them and doing that drawing check-in and, and encourage them mm. to do it every single day that really? that's part oh yeah 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 because it's like um it's like a cycle you know it, it will eventually um where it's wear itself out to the point yeah. where they will finish the end of the book and go right okay that's that's sort of done yeah. they need space to work something out work that fear through yeah. um talking about it isn't always the best the mm. best way just hear it i hear you i hear you're scared we're going to do this together and actually sit and do it with them do a drawing together and then close the book okay, we're going to put that to one side and come back to it tomorrow. I see. So there's a time and a space for it, but actually we yes. have to let it be in all of our life all of the time. It can't be because otherwise it will become all consuming. And I think if you don't give children that, that thing, mm. um, whatever that thing is, then it will spill out and become mm. the topic of conversation at every meal time, at every bedtime, because really what they want you to do is to hear them, is to say, I've got this. Yeah. I've got so this. So the book functions as that sort of container. Yeah. That makes, um, yeah, that makes really good sense. Yeah. And, and then, as I say, started off with, we're going to do this together. In fact, mommy is also going to have her own drawing book and I'm going to do it with you. And you sit down together and you do the drawings in your own books and then you close it. And that's when the puddle jumping happens. It'll be, okay, yeah, yeah, done that. Now I can go off and use some energy to run around the garden or uh, play a game or do something, yeah. do something different. 
knowing that they're going to return to the book the following day. The book, because actually the book functions as a safety object. It's a transitional object for them. So the person who's died has gone, but what is coming in its place is this transitional object, which then they can use um, until they're ready to to close that book and move on. And And you may need to build... Sorry. No, no, they may need to have more, more than one book. <laughs> and I was just going to say, do, they, do you talk to them about what they draw or do you just let them draw and then let it go? I, I tend to say to give them the opportunity to talk about the drawing. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I think you can tune in, use your intuition here. You'll know pretty quickly whether mm-hmm. they want to go there or not. Sometimes I've tried that and then I've been met with... I'm closing the book now. You don't even get the chance because the child's closed the book. They know they don't want to do that. But I would just ask them a question, you know, say, gosh, that looks very interesting. Would you like to tell me about what's in there today? What have you drawn today? Would you like to talk about what you've drawn today? If they shut the book, we respect that. Yeah, we do. And we know we'll come back to it tomorrow. So maybe. And that's the great thing to end with. You know, we're closing the book for now. We're putting our books away. And we'll come back to them tomorrow and we'll open it again tomorrow. Mm. And that opening and closing is an important learning, I think, for children in being able to access the opening and closing of their own grief Mm. in that it doesn't have to be completely open all the time because that's exhausting. Grief is, I mean, I don't know about you, but I know when I've been grieving, Mm. uh, it's physically exhausting to do it. Mm. Um, you can't do it all the time. Yeah. Um, that gives everybody a bit of a break. Yeah. If Absolutely. that makes sense. It mm. does. It makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Mm. And mm. I think maybe there's times when we need to revisit that more, aren't there? When we're coming up to kind of anniversaries or milestones or, or that kind of thing, perhaps that's when we get the book back out, if, even if we mm. haven't for a little while. Or, um, there's a great question here, big question. It might be a whole, whole nother chat, but um, very topical right now. What is your advice about teaching about loss and bereavement, including coping strategies um, to children as whole classes via PSHE or tutor time? I think that'll be on a lot of people's minds as they prepare for mm. the return to September in mm. both primary and secondary. Mm. Mm. I think that that is a whole other chat. <laughs> it's a whole se- contained chat in itself, but I think I would, I would suggest that that's the point at which to uh, teach the the framework, you know, give give the framework and the context, uh, you know, loss change, builds resolution and resilience. I think that that would be helpful for um, for teachers to understand for themselves and to apply that to themselves so that they are kept safe and uh, supported. Um, as they go into, um, you know, a classroom of children where there's going to be a lot of loss and grief. Um, and, and again, to, yeah, teach, teach therapeutic story time telling. That's so important. For big so kids important. as well or just for little ones? I mean, in secondary, would you use it? I would, yeah, there is a way to use it in secondary. Um, you would just change the story. Okay. I, I've seen that taught in secondary schools um, mm. where the, the questions are more interactive and more dynamic okay. and focused around asking something direct like, so what do you see as the obstacle in this story? Mm. Can you relate that obstacle to yourself? And if so, in what way, what would you like the outcome to be? So you would very much have a direct approach with a, with an, a teenage or a, an, you know, a, a, an older audience. Whereas with, a younger group it's a it's all about the metaphor yeah and do you think it's important that this is on our curriculums as we go back or i do i think it should be part of the the transition and the return yeah. um that this is that yeah given 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 equal time uh for children to to have to be able to process in a language that they understand yeah yeah it worries me that they're going to be pushed back too soon into learning yeah 
that worries me too and i think some of what you've talked about how we manage to learn and contain um and know that you know there are times when the book is kind of literally or metaphorically open and times when it's shut learning to do that whether mm. that's because we've had um uh, you know a, a death or a loss of some kind or whether it's just that we've got quite a lot going on in our heads right now and we need to know when mm. we can have time for that worry and when not i think that's going to be quite an important part of the process of getting ready for learning isn't it and uh, it is and I, I read somewhere this morning that you know there are there are some children who actually they do want to get back to learning they don't want yeah. to be talking about the difficult experiences that they've had in lockdown, which mm. to me says there's even more of a need for that. Yeah, I was going to say, that's, <laughs> that's what it says to me as well. That's like, okay, this kid really needs to talk about this. Yeah, exactly. Because it's, mm. that is going underground and, yeah. and we don't want that. So Absolutely. yeah. Yeah. Mm. I mean, and, and we, we, we all do that, don't we? I mean, my, uh, my best friend Joe texted me last night. I'm really struggling with my anxiety at the moment. My best friend Joe texted me last night going, how are you? And I replied, fine. And he went, you want to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> what we do. Yeah. But so, oh, yeah. So what, what, uh, yeah, I mean, we, I'm aware of time and we need to, we need to, to draw to a close, but what do you think are the right things? You know, I work with lots and lots and lots of people who are really worried about how the wider return to school is going to go and what they need to do for the children. What are the most important things they can be doing, do you think? So three things, the three R's, ritual, build a ritual, a time, uh, reading, reflection ritual reading and reflection they do those three things within a open and closed book environment mm -hmm. um, there is a chance that the the children will feel a sense of containment and safety uh, and, and will have a way of a, a space to express how they feel um, and for reading you could put in um, doesn't have to be reading it needs to be a a medium of of play or creativity that's in the child's language that they understand yeah i happen to think that reading is a great and accessible tool to use in a school in this context for for unpacking what i call the invisible backpack you know the invisible backpack of worries and anxieties and stresses um because it's a framework that can be used easily and also it means that that teachers and uh assistants don't have to invent the wheel all the time oh, yeah. yeah i mean there are there are tons as you know of, of exercises in my book about things that can be done in the classroom environment and outside of it and that those are all really useful um but i think if you want something that's that's quicker that's quick it reading reading a short little book is is always going to be something you can grab off a shelf and just take that child aside and spend that that 15 minutes with them and use reflection during that time and you're working on a new resource at the moment aren't you that was how this conversation got triggered so tell us about that yes yeah, so the the uh the how to talk to children about grief and loss is a is a course i'm uh creating for online training purposes for online learning so the book itself can be used uh, obviously you can you can use the exercises but i wanted to do something that was going to probably be video based partly as well and we'll have downloads with worksheets and the exercises that are interactive so that teachers can do that um, online and learn that online uh, because the i think covid has shown us that that we need to have a very strong community sense of community when we're, we're talking about this so i think yeah how to talk to children about grief and loss will be will be an online learning resource as well yeah. so we'll watch this space and uh, look forward to sharing yeah. that in the in the near yeah. future what thought would you like to leave everyone with amanda um a thought of hopefulness really i think that um Grief and loss can be very heavy to talk about, um, serious, serious subject. I think that with, within every grief, with every, within any grief story, there is some kind of lesson or 
speck of hope. And I think it's about finding that, that continue, what I call a continuing bond uh, with yourself and with the person who you've lost. And it's about finding that sense of connection. So I would hope, yes, that, that through doing this kind of work, um, having these conversations, um, that we, we can stay connected to ourselves because that's how we, we stay and process things. Thank you.